Meteorological observations are absolutely crucial to the application of meteorology to societal questions. Nothing that we do in regard to our science can be separated from the observations. People think of such things as weather forecasts and they think of the computer models. Those models are worthless without the observations that go into them, that set the stage for how they start and that update them as they run. Our science has developed from a series of analyses of observations through a course since about 1850 that has led us to an understanding of atmospheric processes that we wouldn't have without those observations. So people think about meteorology as models. That's the end result. The observations are the starting point. Instrumentation provides all the measurements. So whenever I say measurements, there have to be instruments, and they're only as good as the, the instruments. People had no warning of what was going to happen at, uh, as, as late as the early 1800s. And the warning for storms was developed from observing networks. People began first to record what happened. Uh, it rained on my farm at three o'clock and the neighbor says, well, it rained here at four o'clock. And very industrious people compiled those records into maps of what happened and what the progression of the, the weather was. That then led to an effort to develop forecasting and found that if you knew what was coming, you could give some people warning about what was going to happen so that, for example, ships just offshore might take steps if they knew a storm was coming in order to uh, safely weather the, the, the storm. The advances that have taken place since are largely in terms of two areas. One is we can make a lot more observations and get them all assembled together. So there are worldwide networks now that go into these, uh, as well as satellite observations that are very important in compiling the coverage needed. And then there's the development of numerical models, which have supplanted and almost replaced the forecaster who looks at the map and says this is what's going to happen tomorrow. Forecasters still do that, but they do that with much hesitation if they're going against the model because the models have gotten really good. Uh, so, so that is an evolution that I think has led us to our current state. Our models of the atmosphere that we use for forecasting the weather will rapidly go to something unrealistic if they start from an arbitrary starting point. You have to start them from something that is realistic and for example you'd like to start from today's weather and predict what's going to happen tomorrow. The observations will make a prediction and maybe it will be a little bit off so if you carry it to two days the model gets more off, three days the model gets more off and the only solution to that is to feed back observations as you go. Well, the model gets better and better as you adjust it to match what is observed. And when you do that, you have to take into account two things. One is, how good do you think the model is? Do you want to just force things to what the model said despite what the observations are? Or how good do you think the observations are? Are you going to force the model to this regardless of uh, the uncertainty in the measurements? And so there's a compromise between those two to get the, the best solution and it requires understanding both the model error and the observational error. The model then runs another day and you feed more observations in and another day and you feed more observations in so that after you've run for a while you have something that is based on a good history and also is based on all of the observations that you've accumulated over time. And that's what's leading to the real advances in our ability to forecast. The idea that I can have a pretty good idea that it's going to be maybe a little cloudy this afternoon and then rain tomorrow is just mind-boggling in many ways. Uh, it re represents a tremendous advance in our understanding and people like to be, be skeptical about all oh, the weather forecasts. They, they missed it. They don't know what's going on. Actually, they are doing a remarkable job in terms of 
predicting what's going to happen and the few misses are, can be dramatic and catch people's attention and there's room for improvement. But what's been done is a remarkable advance in our ability to understand and live <laughs> with uh, our world. Now when the forecast goes wrong, people look at that and they say, what's wrong here? What have we missed? Oh, maybe we haven't represented the clouds right. So we go back and we study the clouds and we go through this cycle that looks at that again. Revise our model, put it in the clouds in a different way and see if the forecast gets better. Weather forecasting is not all of meteorology. There are many other areas. Trying to understand the fluxes, trying to understand the details of how precipitation forms, how radiative transfer occurs in the atmosphere, and any number of things that have since developed in this science. My own expectation is that the coming years will have to place a great emphasis on fluxes. By fluxes I mean how much of various quantities move through regions in the atmosphere. A water flux would be how much water is evaporated from the ocean and transferred into the air. A CO2 flux would be how much CO2 is transported perhaps downward to be used by plants and, and fixed. So there are all of these roots in the atmosphere that we have to represent in order to get the, the pathways correct. And in many cases, we can't do this very well. Fluxes are among the hardest things to measure. You can measure it well with a research aircraft, but then you get a measurement along a line where the aircraft flew. So I think those are going to have to be a major emphasis in the, the coming years if we're going to really refine our models of how the atmosphere works.